Hey guys, welcome to Your Technology Coach. My name's Steve, your host and teacher for this channel. If you're watching for the first time, this channel is dedicated to assisting you in your STEM education curriculum and helping people develop and improve their job skills in a technology-driven market. In this video, we're gonna discuss the principles of electricity and electronics and perform some hands-on lab experiments to help you apply what you learned in your lessons. Let's ask the question, what is electricity? Hmm. Well, electricity is all around us. It's powering our technology, our cell phones, computers, lights, video games, heaters, air conditioners, cars, and a lot of things around our house that we really don't even think about. We just take it for granted that we flip a switch and something's going to power on, right? So electricity is at work throughout nature, from the lightning in a thunderstorm to the synapses and electrical impulses inside our body that cause our organs to function and our brains to think. But what exactly is electricity? Kind of a complicated question. And as we dig deeper and ask questions, we'll begin to understand how electricity interacts with our surroundings and our daily lives. So going a bit further, electricity is a natural phenomenon. It occurs throughout nature and takes many different forms. In this lesson specifically, we're gonna focus on current, which is flowing electricity. The stuff that powers our electronics, the gadgets we use every day, and the things we talked about in the previous slide. Our goal is to understand how electricity flows from a power source through wires to light up LEDs, spinning motors, and powering our communication devices. So let's talk about the flow of electric charge. So electricity is briefly defined as the flow of electric charge, but there's so much more behind that simple statement, such as where do the charges come from? How do we move them? Where do they move to? And how does an electric charge cause a mechanical motion or make things light up? So to answer those questions, we need to go to the atomic level. Now don't get worried, we're not gonna become nuclear physicists in this lesson. But to begin to explain what electricity is, we need to zoom way in, beyond the matter and the molecules to the atoms that make everything up that we interact with in life. So as building blocks, atoms exist in over a hundred different forms as chemical elements like hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, and copper. Atoms of many types can combine to make molecules, and those molecules combine to make the matter that we can physically see and touch. So an atom is built with the combination of three distinct particles. We have electrons, protons, and neutrons. Each atom has a center called a nucleus, where the protons and neutrons are densely packed together. Surrounding the nucleus are the electrons that are in an orbital pattern. So charge is a property of matter. Just like mass, volume, and density, just as you can quantify how much mass or weight something has, you can measure how much charge it has. The key concept with charge is that it comes in two types. It comes in positive and negative. So let's go atomic for a moment. The atom's electrons aren't all forever bound to the atom. The electrons on the outer orbit or the outer shell of the atom are called balance electrons. With enough outside force, a balanced electron can escape the orbit or the shell of that atom and become free. Free electrons allow us to move a charge, which is essentially what electricity is all about. So electrostatic force, also called Coulomb's law, is a force that operates between charges. It states that a charge of the same type will repel, while charges of opposite types will attract opposites attract and likes repel. If you notice on the chart on the side, there's an example of electrons, positive and negative, attracting, and a positive and positive or a negative and negative repelling. 
So making charges flow. We now have the tools we need to make a charge flow. Electrons in atoms can act as our charge carrier because every electron carries a negative charge. If we can free an electron from an atom and force it to move, we can essentially create electricity. So this chain effect can continue on and on to create a flow of electricity called electric current. All right, guys, so for our lab time, we're going to build two series circuits, both using different components. Uh, for our first lab, we're going to be using a light bulb. So we know kind of what a light bulb does. Uh, we are transferring electrons into heat energy, which appears in the form of light. Uh, for our second lab, we're going to be using a motor. Um, again, this motor is going to be using electrons to create motion. So I want you, as we go through this, to observe the different functions and how things are operating in both these different labs. Okay, folks, so for our lab equipment, um, really we're gonna use the same thing in both labs for the exception of the light bulb in the first experiment and the motor in the second experiment. I'm gonna be using two AA batteries in the first one for a total of 1.5 volts. We'll talk about that during the lab. Uh, the second um, experiment lab, we'll be using three AA batteries. So we'll, we'll need a, a little bit more um, power to run the motor. Conductors, which is just basically copper wire, um, a switch, and if you have a multimeter, um, it'd be good to have. It's optional. Uh, you don't need one of these to do the experiment, but it will give you a good idea of what voltages are uh, on your batteries and on the load. So let's pause real quick and go through some safety precautions. Um, since we are playing or working, shouldn't say playing, we are <laughs> operating and using electricity, um, no matter what the voltage, uh, we want to follow safety protocol. Uh, it's my responsibility as an educator, your responsibility as a student, and your parent's responsibility to make sure you are safe. Uh, so when we are working with a circuit, uh, we always wanna make sure that the power is turned off or disconnected before moving wires or components. We also never plug wires directly into wall outlets. This is a surefire way to end up uh, in the hospital, on the nightly news, or on YouTube. Don't do this. And never work with electric around wet surfaces. Um, water is conductive. It makes things that are already conductive a little more conductive. Um, so we don't want to be a conductor ourselves. We want to keep the electric electricity in the circuit we're working on. We want to always get permission uh, or some kind of authorization when we're working in a classroom or at home uh, from parents or teachers when we're working with electric um, or tools around electric. And always follow the safety rules on the tools or equipment you're working with. So even though we're using AA batteries, uh, they are considered low voltage. There's still a risk of injury if they're not handled correctly. All right, with safety precautions out of the way, let's begin our labs. All right, so here we go with our first lab experiment. Um, this is gonna be using the snap circuit kit that is put out by Alenco. Um, it's one that I kind of used a lot with our kids when we were doing some homeschooling. Uh, it's got a really good follow along book. It's easy for parents uh, to, to do things with. It's got a lot of great um, experiments, all kinds of interesting things going on. Plus, um, it's been around for a long, long time and they come in very different sets. There's smaller sets all the way up to, you know, your, your really expensive systems. So, you know, this one here I purchased for around $20. Um, you can get them at Walmart. You can get them at Hobby Lobby. Um, those kind of places, you can find them online with Amazon. All right, so let's go through the 
parts that we're going to be using for this experiment. All right. Um, with this kit, it comes with a 2.5 volt incandescent light. All right. Now, why the significance of 2.5? Well, earlier I had mentioned that different components have different ratings. The 2.5 volt basically means don't apply any voltage over 2.5. That is the max. Uh, now, there's usually some variation, um, plus or minus, you know, a, a tenth or a hundredth of a volt. Um, but I've seen people take these and apply way too much power, 5 volts, 10 volts, and watch it pop the, uh, the light bulb. We don't want to do that. Uh, again, make sure we're following our safety precautions. Not a, you know, We're going to be using the parts as manufacturally designed. All right. Um, we have a basic switch. This is a slider switch. Um, as you can see, there's a symbol on here. There's a universal symbol. So as you as we go through our different videos, as we get a little more advanced, we'll know that this is a schematic drawing or a symbol for a switch. You can see that it's currently open. So remember we spoke earlier about something being off or on. So an off position means the circuit is open. There's no electrical fl flow going through the circuit, no electrons. The closed indicator means that the switch is closed, contact is being made, electrons are flowing to the parts. All right, we're going to start that in the off position. This is our battery pack, otherwise known as our source. Uh, batteries, just so you're, you're aware, are chemical energy. There's, there's a storage of chemical energy. It can be tra transformed into electrical energy. So there are small electronic cells uh, in these um, that's usually a combination of battery acid and some kind of metallic substance. Um, and that is what's generating the electricity, which currently we're calling this, this is, this is stored electric um, or potential energy. So, Again, on this battery pack right here, there's a maximum, there's a, a number three, that's a three volt battery pack. We do not want to exceed this. We want to keep it within the guidelines of what it is meant to be used for. And then we have our, our common conductors. Um, again, with this kit, I, I like it a lot because there's there's different um, sizes. This is a three, three terminal, this is a five terminal. So they're easy to put together, they're easy to um, identify, they're easy to snap into place, hence the name Snap Circuit. All right, so we're gonna finish putting our conductors in place. All right. Okay, so we have our first conductor here, going from our positive terminal of our battery pack to the terminal of the incandescent light. Now, if you notice, there is no positive or negative on the light. It's just, it is what it is. So, um, as long as we have electrons flowing across this battery, or I'm sorry, across this light, we'll get the glow and it'll be fine. There are some components, though, that will have a, what we call a polarity. So, there will be a positive and a negative, and they can only go that direction, none other. Um, putting them in an opposite direction could either burn the device up or cause it to not function as designed. All right, we'll put our last conductor piece in place. And we're going to go with our two AA batteries. Um, these are, these are 1.5 volts each. So anytime you see a AA, no matter what brand is it, it is, whether it's a generic store-bought or a brand name, all right, they're 1.5 volt. Usually the only difference is uh, in manufacturing that could be um, the durability, the, you know, how long they last. Uh, I've never done an actual battery test, but I'm sure Duracell being the name it, that it is, this 1.5 might last a little longer than this one here. I don't know. I just got a really good deal on these. All right, now I can also tell you that these batteries are not fully charged. I've been using them for a while, so we're gonna get something out of them, but not, you know, we won't get a full, a full three volts out of these. 
All right, so when I'm putting these in, again, I'm making sure they're going. These are absolutely have to go in positive and negative. Uh, otherwise, that's not going to work. All right. So I did mention that an optional item would be a multimeter. Um, now, a multimeter is a tool, uh, is, a, is a designed for a purpose. And basically, this one here will tell me the volts going across the circuit, indicated here. And it will also tell me the resistance of a specific circuit or device. So right now, I'm at zero because I have nothing connected. All right. Um, so... I'm sure you can tell me what's going to happen when we close the circuit. Absolutely. The circuit is going to complete, is going to force the, we talked about the valence electrons in, in the material to start transmitting and creating the current flow around the circuit. So here we go. So you can see that my light is glowing. And again, we talked about why that, that light glows. So uh, if you're familiar with the way lights work, or if not, there is a, what we call a filament. And that filament is a fine hair-like piece of material. Uh, sometimes they use tungsten. They can use different uh, types of elements that when the electrons pass across it, it causes it to glow and give off heat energy. So right now we're transferring chemical energy to electrical energy to heat energy. Now, if I was to take my multimeter, again, my, my black lead is usually my negative, red is usually positive, and I'm going to put these on the circuit. Now, this is safe. Remember, we're, we're, we want to also practice our safety rules, so what I'm doing here is absolutely safe as long as I'm not plugging it into a high voltage. This is all low voltage. So if I make my connectors here and I touch those, I can see on my multimeter that I'm running 2.25 volts. If I come up here and touch these terminals, I'm running about 2.3 volts. Now that's because there's resistance, all right? We do have a slowing down, or a resistance is basically the, the slowing down or restricting of electrons for movement. So if I'm going across this lead here, which this is a resistor, my voltage is going to be smaller than what it is coming out of the battery pack. All right. So in this, in this uh, lab, we've understood the principle of the electrons flowing through the circuit. We have our source or our battery or chemical energy, our light energy, and our switch that controls the flow of the circuit. Good job. All right, so our second lab is going to be everything that we just did in the first lab, except we're replacing the incandescent light with a motor, all right? So previously we took the chemical ener energy and turned it into light or heat energy. This time we're gonna be taking the potential chemical energy and turning it into mechanical energy, all right? So if you notice too, I did swap out the battery pack. That's because Again, when we use components of different types and different sizes, they require different voltages. All right, so this um, device um, takes a little more power. Uh, this 1.5 times three adds up to 4.5 volts. So we need at least 4.5 volts to operate the, the motor here. So in order to be able to see the motor, I'm gonna be putting this little pinwheel on there. All right. So as we go through this, I'm going to put my terminals back on. Now, also, this is polarity sensitive. Now, from a perspective of damage, it won't really occur on this type of motor. First of all, it's a very small voltage. And there's 
uh, not, there's nothing really going to be connected to this that's going to damage or injure something if I was to reverse the, pol um, you know, the polarity on these circuits. The only thing it will do, though, is if I have this connected here, all right, and I have my positive to my positive, my negative to my negative, and I turn this on, it operates the battery, or it operates the motor, and it's hard to see, but it's going um, in a clockwise direction. I wish I could slow it down, um, but it is going in a clockwise direction. If I was to take this, oops, look at that, and reverse it, where I was putting my negative to my positive, and my positive to my negative, if I can get that on there, right? You would see that it is going counterclockwise. And when we get into our, our motor part of this uh, series, we'll understand a little bit about why that happens. But essentially there is a, a wound coil um, inside this motor that operates on magnetic energy. Uh, but we'll talk about that in a different series. But reversing the polarity also reverses the, the um, direction that the motor is turning. So we're gonna put it back to where it was. All right. All right, so we've got everything put back together. We have the motor ready to go. And I'm gonna just put this little pinwheel back on here so we can actually see what's gonna happen, what's going on there. Um, I am going to go ahead and test the batteries one more time. Um, I'm going to go across the two leads here. And I'm getting 4.3 volts. All right, 4.3 total volts right there. So I'm definitely within the 4.5 range. I'm not going to explode the, the motor. So everything seems to be safe. I've made my changes with the circuit turned off and I'm ready to launch this circuit so here we go you can do a drum roll if you'd like to but i don't think it's necessary ah there we go all right i'm going to turn it off and there we are so we turned the chemical energy the potential chemical energy in these batteries into electrical flow, which powered the motor, causing mechanical energy to turn the propeller. All right, good job. Lab two completed. All right, so welcome back to the lesson. So during your lab, did you make any observations? Did you write anything down? It's always a good idea to have a notebook, pen, paper handy just to make any additions or corrections to things that you're working on during the experiments. So what did you observe? What worked or didn't work and why? What materials needed to be changed and or kept? And did the size of the battery or size of the load give you enough current to energize the circuit? Why or why not? And did you have other people test or look at your work to give you some feedback. Sometimes it's a good idea to get some second set of eyes or a third set of eyes on your project just to get some other ideas or some feedback on some things you could improve or maybe something you're doing wrong or unsafe. So now that you have a better understanding of how electricity works and how it applies to a, a functional product, you may want to go back and redesign some things and take some ideas from your first project in design and make make some changes maybe add some new materials or try a different build or try different sizes and, and uh, of batteries and different loads or write down and show some images of the product or uh, some things that you've done during the design process also remember it's a good idea again to get feedback from your parents and teachers make sure you're doing it right and doing it safe All right, you probably didn't know this was coming, but we're gonna do a final quiz. We've gone through our lesson. 
we've gone through the practical application in the lab. So let's answer six questions just to make sure you've got it up here in your head ready to go. So question number one, what supplies the energy in an electric circuit? Is it a conductor, a light bulb, a wire, or a battery? Well, if you've answered battery, that would be correct. Battery is what supplies the energy, the chemical energy that moves the electrons in an electric circuit. Number two, which material is a conductor? Now we didn't go over this too much in this series, in this, this first lesson, but we're going to do that in other lessons to come, so stay tuned. So which material is a conductor? Plastic, copper, glass, or wood? Well, I think you remember from our experiment earlier that copper wire is what we use, so that's got to be a pretty good conductor to move electrons through the conduit. So which of these could be considered or used as a resistor in a circuit? So remember, a, a resistor is something that it provides a load. Um, it's going to generate heat. It could gener generate motion. So a pencil, a gas engine, a rubber eraser, or an electric motor. That's right. Electric motor would be considered a resistor in a circuit. All right, question number four. Which type of circuit is circuit A? So if you look at circuit A, we have a load, conduit, I'm sorry, a source or a, a battery, a load, which is the light, and a penny for some reason. They're using that. So if you look at the way things are, are in a little bit of a, what do you call a circular pattern here, we would call this a what? A series, a parallel, perpendicular, or a current? Well, this is called a series circuit. And again, we didn't talk about that too much, but it's pretty apparent by the way things are designed in the circuit that they are all in series, which means one after the other. So which item is a resistor in circuit B? So if we look down here at circuit B, we have the source, uh, we have a light bulb and another light bulb, and our copper conductors. So the resistor, would that be the light bulb, the wire, the battery, or the screws? Well, if you answered light bulb, you would be absolutely correct. That would be the resistor because the electrons flowing through the filament, which is sometimes made of a very hair thin element like tungsten uh, or something else that would glow when uh, electrons would provide heat across it, uh, would actually be a resistor. And our final question, why do you think, or why did the person who made circuit A probably connect a wire, or I'm sorry, a, uh, connect the wires to a penny? That's kind of odd. You think they would have a switch in place there. So you think they needed to use the penny to make the light bulb? Or you think they were testing to see if the penny conducts electricity? Or they used a penny to supply extra power? Well, the penny uh, doesn't have any power of itself. It is only a conductor. Or does the penny prevent sparks? Probably not. Probably not high enough voltage for that. So if you were uh, probably maybe testing things out, you wanted to find out what different conductors um, would work, uh, you would probably want to use this as a test. So I would think they were probably using this to see, hey, does a penny really work? And yes, yes it does. All right, well, good answers. I hope you got all those correct. All right, guys, well, that's gonna wrap up the first of our video series on principles of electronics. Um, my goal in this video was to help you all understand um, better what electricity is, uh, how it flows, and how to apply it to light and motion. 
Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video and you found it helpful for your, your STEM education planning. Uh, if you did, please hit the like, subscribe buttons, and share it with your community. Share it with your homeschool uh, parent groups. Uh, share it in your public school uh, with your teachers. Also, please comment below if you have questions or feedback. Uh, we'd love to hear that. We'd love to hear your suggestions on future videos. Uh, also, there are links below in the description that will um, show you where to go for uh, doing some research on some famous inventors, uh, famous researchers, Thomas Edison, Alessandra Volta, uh, Nikola Tesla, as well as links that will take you to the um, purchase pages um, or product details for the kits that we used in today's videos. So again, thank you for watching. My name is Steve, your host and teacher for the Technology Coach.